So, Jamal Nayaz here with the legend Alex Winter, the legend himself. We're here at For the Love of Horror. We've got the cast of The Lost Boys with us. That's true. Now, you have said in previous interviews that you knew early on in shooting that you were part of something very special. You just get that sort of, like, tingling in your tummy where you're just like, this is something seriously different to anything I've experienced. Just looking back at where you were in, in your life back then to where you are now, how incredible an experience was that uh i mean having done a lot of work since then though i started pretty young as a child actor so i'd done a fair amount of work before that uh but what joel schumacher the director put together was pretty unique uh so none of us really knew exactly what movie we, we were in when we got cast it changed a lot the script kept changing the wardrobe kept changing the vision was sort of building in his mind um but I knew the first day I was on set, we were shooting, the first day I got to Santa Cruz, they were shooting the beach scene with Tim all oiled up and the yeah. fires and like thousands of people on the beach. I looked around and thought, okay, this, this movie has a very interesting and specific vibe. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just kind of on the ride from then on. And, uh, you know, looking back at it now, it was definitely one of the most f fun experiences I've had on a job ever. And I think that's the case for a lot of the, the guys that are here that were in the movie. Um, I just think it was a very special time in our lives. Joel ran a really familial, uh, fun set. Uh, so I think for all of us, it was, it was hard. It was a tough shoot. But it was also just an enormous amount of fun, especially playing one of the vampires. Because we basically, I was up all night and I slept all day for months. Uh, so we got up to a lot of trouble. It became one. Basically, <laughs> we, we, we got up to a lot of trouble. Yeah, Yeah, because Joel described it, because obviously you were such young guys at the time. You're in a beautiful place, hot weather, a lot of young people. Obviously, a lot of parties were happening. He described it as a non-stop rave. Was that how you recalled it as well? That's how I don't recall it, but <laughs> <laughs> that's why I don't recall it. Yeah, yeah, I think I remember three nights out of the three months I was in Santa Cruz but uh yeah and we were on motorcycles every night and we were like a band so we'd be shooting the scenes driving up and down the boardwalk and there would be thousands and thousands of people that would come out to watch us shoot all night and uh it was just really fun uh, you know it was a, a very it was a very kind of communal experience even with the older actors they were big Broadway actors most of them Diane Weiss, Bernard Hughes, Edward Herman um so we had a lot of reverence for other members of the cast. We didn't think we were that great, to be honest with you. We were young, and it was kind of all of our first big movie. Uh, but it was special. And I think, you know, I spoke to Billy before, and I spoke to Jason as well. I think the, the turning point for me as a viewer, where you're like, wow, this isn't, you know, what Joel kind of portrayed it as initially, where he was talking about it could have been like the Goonies. This isn't the Goonies. When the beach scene happens, yeah. people's heads are getting ripped off. There's blood flying everywhere. I was like, I was watching it as a kid, and I was like, oh, it's going in this direction. I absolutely love this. You've got yeah. blood like all down your chest and everything. Yeah. Like, what was that experience like to shoot that scene? Was that maybe your favorite scene to shoot? Would you say? Um, yeah, the beach, the beach killing scene was definitely my favorite. That and the death scene because it's just fun dying on screen. So that was a fun scene. But those two scenes were my favorite. And I think Kiefer's talked about this in interviews, but we pushed, you know, as I remember it, Kiefer, Kiefer and I specifically were pushing Joel to get more violent. Now, that doesn't mean we were changing his vision because he had a very specific, specific vision. And we had, uh, you know, I had enormous respect for what he was doing. Uh, but I know that I wanted that scene to be very graphically violent, even if they cut it fast and we didn't see all of it. Um, and so that's something that he was building into the makeup and kind of into the shock reveal of us as vampires. Uh, so that sequence, shooting that sequence was a lot of fun. We shot it all on a soundstage. So um, it was all built, that entire thing was built as a set with the trees and the dunes and the fire and everything. Uh, and it was a lot of fun to shoot because they let us do kind of every idea we had for violence they let us do. And I wanted to like rip the guy's mohawk off and yeah. Kiefer wanted to bite into the guy's head. Yeah, and, he did. He and he did. absolutely <laughs> did bite into the guy's head. Um, and Joel rolled with it, but I mean, he rolled with it because it fit within his vision, which was that you had these sort of like cute guys in this sort of like idyllic atmosphere in an era, like you said, when the movies for that demo were kind of sweet and innocent. Mm -hmm. And then it just takes this turn and it's a pretty radical turn. Did you like know when you were shooting that, that, that this is the turning point now? This is like the awakening of the vampires. And it's where Michael realizes, Jason Patrick's character, he realizes that he's just 
being turned into a killing machine, essentially. He's not... The, he's been sold this idea of, like, being immortal forever, but it's not about being immortal. It's about being a predator. It's about, like... Yeah. Preying on the innocent. Yeah. What I, love, what I love about the kind of bait and switch of the movie, which a lot of movies do this with their marketing, is like the poster's like he's in sunglasses and it's like vampires are cool, party all night, you know? And that's the vibe until you get to that scene and then it's like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, Blood and there's a lot time. more to this than partying all night, yeah. right? Um, and I just love that, that they you know, laid their cards on the table that way. It was, it was bold. What was it like attending the premiere and watching the film on the big screen for the first time? And obviously, we've got G. Tom Mack here as well. He's performing later tonight. Hearing that score as well, absolutely iconic, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the thing for me was that uh, I was a film student at the time. I was at NYU Film School at the time that I made that movie as a film student. So I was a huge fan of all the people that Joel had hired, Michael Chapman and Susie Becker and all these incredible people, Bo Welch. Uh, production designer everyone on it was like top of the of the field so i i knew we were in really good hands but i also knew about a third of the way into working on it that joel had this kind of very specific movie in his head that none of us were going to understand completely till we saw it so none of us really knew the movie till we saw it and i wouldn't say any of us did and it's so cool and so rare as an actor to watch a movie where you just know that it works from like the first shot and you're like Oh, wow. Like from that first like helicopter shot across the water down into the carousel, you're like, oh, damn. Like he's on and the way the music kicks in and then the way it kicks into the echo and the bunny man track. Yeah. Um, we were just, I was just floored. I was like, oh, thank God. Like the guy pulled it off, but he's like really pulled it off. He like made something really that just works. And, you know, again, I'm not saying it's some grand masterpiece or anything, but it it's, is, hard, it is a masterpiece. it's hard to make movies that work. Right, and that worked that well, and the movie just works. And so, seeing it in the premiere for me, I remember because it was both a cast and crew and a premiere. Uh, none of us had seen it, and um, we were all really blown away by how well the whole film worked all the way to the last shot. I mean, Joel's eye for fashion was obviously apparent to him and people around him long before the film because he had the background in the fashion industry. Oh, yeah. But for yourself, you know, when you're in the costume for the first time and you're around Kiefer and Billy and, and everyone else wearing your costume, you must be thinking, we're the coolest guys alive right <laughs> now. Maybe until you put the contacts in and you've all like got tears streaming down your face because exactly. they were so uncomfortable. Yeah, or the fake mullet. But, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the thing was is it, the script was changing a lot as – as we got cast. So the way it was originally written, because I was a mo big motorcycle driver. At that, I mean, I still am, but I was a big motorcycle rider at that time. Um, and the way it was originally written, it was much more like kind of the wild ones, that Marlon Brando movie, like leather jacket wearing, triumph riding motorcycle guys, mm -hmm. right? Like much more of your standard kind of image of guys that ride bikes in a gang almost. And I remember going to see Susie Becker's wardrobe, um, not knowing what the vibe had turned into. And and I got there early because I'm I am like chronically early to everything. That's like, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. In this case, it was a blessing because I got there and she had just laid all the clothes out on the floor. She had this massive office at Warner Brothers. And she's like, you're lucky. You're the first actor. You get to choose whatever you want. And there was that jacket. Yeah. And I was like, Susie, I can't not take that jacket. She's like, you're right. You can't not take that jacket. You're a lucky bastard. So that's how I ended up with that jacket. Um, and I was just blown away by her designs. They were incredible. I mean, and so weirdly idiosyncratic. Um, it makes you wonder who... And what I thought was really smart about what Joel and Susie did with the wardrobe was like, it makes you wonder who these guys are. Like, what era are they even from? Yeah. They've been you around know? for hundreds of years, yeah, apparently. They don't, they don't dress like regular people. Yeah. So, like, they've just obviously, like, patched their lives together over hundreds of years. And that gave me internally a lot of stuff to work with with the character that I didn't need to expose in any way other than just to have it on hand. You know, you mentioned that you were experienced in, uh, you're experienced motorcycle driver, but uh, it seemed that Kiefer wasn't. You know, he broke his wrist during the shoot. Well, to be fair, we all rode bikes. We, you you couldn't get hired like on the very on the second audition like or maybe the third because we had a lot of auditions but on the second or third audition Richard Donner was there in the room with Joel who was producing the movie who made Goonies and Superman and everything else and Donner's big giant guy kind of intimidating because Joel was very sweet and immediately made you feel at ease and Donner just looked at me I'm the only one I mean it's like five of them and this little punk kid right it was in New York so I was coming out of class 
And he looked at me, he's like, do you really ride a bike or are you bullshitting? <laughs> right? That was like the first thing out of his mouth. I was like, oh my God, thank God I'm not lying. Because, you know, every actor lies, right? Can you fly a plane? Sure, of course, <laughs> hire me. Um, but I did. I rode every single day. So I was like, yes, I ride a bike. It's right outside the office. Uh, and so Kiefer rode. We, we couldn't get the job without riding. Um, but, <laughs> but he was hot dog. So he broke his wrist because he tried to pop a wheelie. While we were, I remember it like it was yesterday. We're like hanging out. There was a lot of downtime on the boardwalk. There's thousands of people there. They're all cheering and stuff. It's kind of a pumped up atmosphere. And Kiefer decides to hot dog it like between takes. Like it wasn't during a take. We were just waiting for the camera, which is what you're always doing on a shoot. And he, I was watching him. I was like, he's not going to, oh, my God, he's going he's gonna to pop a wheelie. Oh, my God. And he was like just showing off for the crowd. He popped a wheelie, went all the way over. And I was like, ugh, that was so inevitable. Um, so that was it. It was just the, emo- the the high of the moment got to him. Were you laughing at him or were you concerned? No, I was concerned. You don't <laughs> laugh at someone who has a motorcycle accident. He was showing off. I know, but as a motorcycle rider, like that's like that's like the chills. That's like, blah, you know, you want to make sure. That, I mean, I think we all rushed him. was like, is he hurt? How badly is he hurt? Okay, you're not that badly hurt. You fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's the reaction that we needed. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, but it was, you know, we were concerned for him. It's a pretty simple question, this, but I'm guessing it was very difficult to do. You know, Joel, like you said, the direction of the film and and the script was changing throughout the process in terms of where the story was heading. But what was it actually like understanding how scary he wanted you to be and and, and putting that on screen? Uh, That was clear in the audition. Like, the audition played with various aspects to those characters. So I knew coming out of the audition that the movie turned. Like, there was gonna, it was, he was going to play the, the horror scenes for real, mm-hmm. uh, which made me very happy. Um, and, uh, and Joel was an extremely communicative director. So there was no manipulation or evasiveness. He just told you what he wanted. And, and we all talked about the, the bonfire scene a lot. And like my death scene a lot um, and how that was going to play. So it would actually have stakes, you know, because the death, my death scene is really enjoyable because it's kind of the, it's the first vampire death in the movie, but it's also one of the only, it's a scene that really takes a lot of the thrills of the Goonies, including having Corey there, right? In this kind of underground cave and like very sort of Goonie-esque sequence. And then it just like turns in this very intense way. Uh, so that was super fun and very communicated by Joel of what he wanted to do and by Donner, who was making Lethal Weapon at the time. So he was ma- in the middle of making a hard-boiled movie as well. When was the last time that you watched the film? And do, do you like watching your own films back? No, I don't um, at all. But, uh, but I was at the Prince Charles Cinema in London, I think about a year ago, and we just screened a bunch of films that I, that I have there over like a five-day weekend. Um, and my son, my youngest son was with me, and he'd never seen the movie. So I was like, there's no better way to see it than in a theater with an audience on a really nice print. Uh, so I had to watch it. Yeah. Um, so I sat with him, and, and we had such a good time. It was fun to watch the movie work. He was 13, maybe 12 at the time. It was fun to watch the movie work on a young person of a new generation where, who's seen everything. Yeah. You know, now like kids, because of the internet, you know, they're, they're into like the hardest, hardcore stuff like right away. So, uh, but it was still super entertaining for him. Is it a real trailblazer of a film, like all time classic? And for me, still the best vampire film that's ever been made. What you guys did it was, uh, it was really revolutionary for the horror genre and for vampires as well. Oh, that's, I mean, it's fun for, for anyone, you know, to be in anything that has that kind of vibe for people or longevity. You, you know, I don't care how cocky anybody is, you never know when you're making a movie if it's going to be good, if anyone's going to care, yeah. if it's going to last. You don't know. Nobody knows. I mean, they didn't know on Star Wars, right? So uh, it's really, you know, sweet to us. That's why we're here. Like, you know, for me and Kiefer and, you know, and Jason and Billy, like for the gang to kind of come back together what is it, 35? Like, how many years later is it? 35? Uh, was it 87? 87. 80, 1987, yeah. so, so I'm like not 35. good at maths. Yeah. He, he's better at maths than me. <laughs> yeah, so it's a little, it's like 36 years. So, so I remember the year, though. Yeah, um, that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. And uh, uh, and we know that. Like, that's like, it's, it's, it's extraordinary for us. Uh, it's not something that we take for granted. So, you know, it's sweet. And we, you know, all love each other. Like, we're, you know, it's... Uh, 
we had a tight bond on the set and we sort of maintained it but uh it's a sweet thing for us to be able to come back and connect with fans you know some older some younger Mm -hmm. who just think who really enjoy the movie i mean that's like that's why you do this so it's a real gift does it blow your mind that it's actually like a key element of people's lives like you see families here today you see like partners in relationships where this film will have brought people together they'll say oh do you like Lost Boys? Oh, you like Lost Boys? Oh, let's go and watch it. Da da da. That sort of thing. Like that, that. I've seen stuff like that happen like time and time again, and you'll have seen it at, like countless conventions like today. What is that like? Actually, being part of part of people's lives and their journeys. I mean, it's sweet. There's a certain amount of detachment because it's like obviously, you know, there's a lot of people involved in creating this thing, and you're just you're just a little piece of it, right? So there's a certain amount of detachment of just like I have a. It's almost like you're on the same level as everybody else. Like you're another person that was glad the movie exists, right? That has a special relationship with it. So there's like a kinship. It's similar to me with Bill and Ted where like the fans of Bill and Ted, I don't feel like, like, you know, I just sort of created some amazing thing that I then bestowed upon the world. Yeah. It's like I'm part of something and they're part of something. It's sort of, that's what's cool about movies is a very communal. Theater is like that too. It, it really plugs people together uh, there's a very u- kind of unifying component to that. And uh, so that's what I like about, you know, the experience of being, at least in the, with those two movies that have really lasted over the years, you just feel like you're kind of part of some big, you know, communal experience that people have had that you're part of. You Amazing. Know? Well, I really appreciate your time. I know there's a lot of people that want to meet you and uh, share the love of the film with you today and across the weekend so just enjoy every second of it and everyone's so happy to have you here yeah it's great to be here so it's my second time here and uh you know it was run it was run really well last time but it's it is a pretty well oiled machine so it makes it easy perfect we really appreciate that thank you so much for your time yeah thanks